I thought that um, since the festival is in the space and this most of it is focused on sort of artistic and theoretical approaches, it would be nice to have a session about sort of the more organizational uh, facilitating side of things, curating the things. And I think um, like this festival, it takes an enormous amount of effort to organize things and also to um, support um, spaces and platforms for artists to show their work. And, um, and also, especially on a long-term uh, basis, you have to deal with sort of running spaces, financial issues, funding, and all this. Um, so I invited three people to come to talk about this today. Um, first, we'll have Daniel Barret, who's an independent curator. And um, I was also involved in one of those projects called Birdwatch, which we'll talk about, but it's, it's sort of a, a gallery that travels around. And uh, after Daniel, we'll have Cafe Otto, which is, um, including myself, a lot of musicians' sort of favorite venue right now in the world. And um, there's something about it that's, that's very brilliant. And um, so I have them. And then my other favorite venue in Holland, which I wish I could say Stein was as cool, but I think Warm is one of the um, cool places um, in the other city. And uh, so we have three of those guys over here, too. And uh, so we'll have them talk about their work. And then at the end, I thought we could have sort of a discussion with uh, the organizers. Yeah. And, uh, Thanks. Hello. Thanks for being here. I'm uh, really, really thanks to the organizers for having me here. Um, I'm uh, really happy to share with you uh, some thoughts about the Birdcage, um, which is a project that is start uh, almost one year ago uh, in March 2009, and um, with three episodes uh, realized in Stockholm, Amsterdam, and Beijing. And um, I'm still trying to find a definition for Birdcage. Uh, I still try to, to understand how to call it. And maybe after one year is, is the time to do it. But um, the problem is, is uh, with, with the word, I mean, with really the term uh, definition, it has this uh, connotation <coughs> of a limit. Um, when you define something, you close something in, in, uh, in a fixed notion. Um, which, in a way, it was the opposite of uh, what I wanted to do uh, with Burkage, uh, whether I wanted to uh, create an experience uh, which was more based on a concept that is more fluid and that, has, uh, that is also taking shape through practice. Uh, so it's, it's, it's like um, an, an, a concept in evolution, in a way. Um, it is also uh, difficult to, to identify the workage with, with the existing models uh, around because uh, it, is not, it is not a gallery, uh, it is not a venue, uh, it is not, it is not um, a festival, it is not an agency, um, but maybe uh, it has something uh, in common with all of these models. So um, it's, it's a sort, uh, in a way, it's a sort of meta structure because um, it goes uh, beyond uh, these, model, these models as something with these models, but it's also something um, in, constant, in constant transformation, um, like, like a, a little bit like a mental space, but also a physical space, which is uh, in transformation. So to speak a little bit about uh, the ideas which are behind the birdcage, one um, inspiration um, that I had uh, was from the Gallery Without Walls by French writer André Marot, uh, which is an idea that had an, a big influence uh, on, on contemporary culture in different, in several ways. And uh, Marot uh, wanted to break open the walls of the gallery, of the museum, uh, in his case, uh, using photographies. Um, so his idea, I think it was really, really strong, this, this idea of going beyond the limit of the place. And uh, to, to find uh, connections between uh, different places, art from different cultures, 
and also uh, different uh, temporalities. Um, so in a way I wanted to, to realize um, a sonic version of, of this uh, gallery without walls um, because uh, sound uh, by definition is something that uh, is, very, is very difficult to be um, uh, constrained, uh, to, be, to be limited to a physical space because also sound, um, as we know, is, is very, very easy to be adapted in, in many different situations. And also because of this uh, very interesting uh, quality of sound, of um, being able of um, transforming, transforming the perception of the place, or at least influence how we perceive a place. So through, through this idea of the gallery, um, of the birdcage, uh, I wanted in a way to, to, to see at which, at which, until which point you, you can work on this uh, idea of the sound as being site specific. So this, how, this is how I came to, to the idea of uh, a mobile, um, gallery, sound gallery, a gallery where the artists are uh, invited to assign each time a new location for it. So it can be um, it can be a tree uh, in a park. It can be there are many places. I mean, of course, the, the possibilities are are really open. It can be under a bridge in a public space. Um, it can be an astronomic observatory, like a project in preparation for September in Rome, as we, we will see. It can be a swimming pool, as this old piece by, by Max Nehaus uh, from the 70s. Um, it's really um, which, a piece which was made like really, really long time uh, before the, the, the idea of the birdcage, of course. Um, but the possibilities are really, really open. I mean, it's, it's not, um, uh, it is really uh, in a way to not, to not limit, to not put limitation to the vision of the artist. Well, uh, maybe that's uh, a little bit too much. <laughs> I think I should, yeah, at least. Okay. Um, yeah, so where was? Um, yeah, just I mean um, the context. I mean, um, if the artists are invited to through this selection of of a place, there is a whole a whole uh, uh, thinking. I mean, the artist is is involved in thinking about the context. So not only about the work but also thinking about uh, everything that is around the work. Uh, so th that means also thinking about how your work has an impact on the, on the audience. And just to make um, some examples, I'm gonna, from, from the projects which, which were part of the uh, Burkage until now, I'm gonna talk about it later, but just uh, to give uh, some example, well, when um, Taku, um, select this empty shop here in Amsterdam, uh, in Zidaik. There is a very, um, there is a relation which is established between the inside space and the outside space. Um, when Yan Jun uh, experimented with uh, a very specific context uh, in this in this newspaper office. There is uh, a direct relation for, with a different type of audience. And same in Stockholm, when uh, Karl Michael von Hauswolf uh, also, he uh, made a decision about the audience when he decided to host his work uh, in, in the living room of a, of a private house. So before, before I mean, um, uh, the, the important aspect of the, of the project, of the Burkage, 
is to create this sort of indistinction between the artwork and the gallery. Um, in a way, the artwork is, is incorporated, uh, and the opposite, the gallery is incorporated in the, in the artwork. And this also means that there is um, a sort of uh, putting together curatorial uh, discourse and artistic strategies, or at least that there is like a very, very strong dialogue between the two. So before, before going to, to, to see the episodes, I just want to have a look uh, back at history um, because, of course, such, such, such type of experimentation has been done uh, many times in history, and, it's, and particularly in a, in, a, in a period of time, like uh, especially in the 60s and the 70s, um, where artistic uh, experimentation and theorization were made around the notion both of the exhibition space, so the white cube, and as well as uh, on the concert hall. So uh, here we see uh, like a seminal uh, text by Brian Hodarty uh, inside the white cube. Uh, by the way, this installation is by a French artist who, who, take, who took the book with its its shape, which is square, and created a white cube made of inside white cube inside the white cube. So that's, that's, his name is Jan Serendur. But anyway, um, yeah, I mean, many, many artists and uh, also uh, critics, but also musicians were experimenting, were criticizing, were uh, reflecting on um, were innovating um, the space for the performance and for the exhibition. So that's, that is, I think, is very uh, important. And um, this work by uh, Bruce Nauman, Get Out of My Mind, Get Out of This Room, uh, is very representative and symbolical for the time. This is from 68, if I'm not wrong. And um, it's both for the title uh, and for the fact that it's made only by sound. Uh, and there is the voice of Nauman uh, really, really whispering in, in a very aggressive wave, uh, way um, these words. So it's like an empty exhibition space uh, feel it only, only, only with sound. Um, so, uh, what is interesting is that the relation between sound and space um, has been used, has been found by by many artists and musicians as as a way, as a strategy to, for for innovation and for experimentation. Just to mention uh, some example. Um, we have this, uh, we have, for example, a visual artist, Vito Conci, who, um, who was invited to the, to the collective show at the Whitney Biennial, and he decided to, to, set be, to be apart from the show and to, to use the, the stairs of the museum instead using uh, speakers, so using sound. Or in this other work of him, where he really uh, wants to go uh, out of the gallery space. He really wants to, to, and using sound, and by the way, there are the, the birdcage. Um, so you, it's, you can see how, how this, it's really uh, the idea of finding a, a, a way out of the gallery. But to go uh, in the musical field, we have this famous concert by Stockhausen at the Jaita Grotto in Lebanon, where he uh, wanted to uh, use and uh, make advantage and explore the, the acoustic of the, of the grotto. So he brought the public down into, into, into this grotto. And uh, Max Neuhaus, 
he uh, a musician that uh, then uh, um, became a sound artist and that we can see here here he installing his piece um, Times Square uh, that is which has been re reactivated uh, recently and is still on a sound installation at, at Times Square so enough theory let's go to to the uh, to the actual episodes of Burkage the first one uh, was realized by Mikael von Auspov in Scott Stockholm and he produced this uh, radio object uh, which is uh, broadcasting uh, a sound signal um, a fix at a fixed frequency and uh, this frequency is uh, 1485 kHz which is also known as the Jurgensen free, uh, frequency. Who is uh, Friedrich Jurgensen? Uh, you may know uh, from uh, Michael von Auswald's work that he's dedicating a lot of work to this man who um, spent uh, many years of his life, like 10 years, 15 years, to um, hearing uh, voices coming from the other side. And, um, and, uh, and especially to developing uh, sound uh, technology techniques to capture these these uh, voices. Um, so the frequency is uh, is is a way to create the condition for this communication. Um, so uh, Miguel installed the the, the piece, uh, decided the set as a setting for the piece the living room of his uh, colleague and fellow and next door uh, neighborhood artist, um, Jan Hastrom, who is a painter who has nothing to do with sound, but uh, who had to keep this radio action uh, object in, uh, in his living room for one month and, uh, and turn it on whenever there was a dinner there. So there is a very, very, I mean, um, uh, of course, a different uh, audience about from what you can see, I mean, uh, from, what, from how you can experience a work in a gallery or, or at a concert. This, uh, in this case, you had, you had to experience the experience of the work. It was only restrict to invitation and to a dining event. So that's, that is the vernissage, actually. To move on to, move on to, to Amsterdam, uh, as I mentioned, uh, DJ Sniff uh, did uh, this intervention aimed at uh, transforming uh, an empty and a temporary em empty shop in Zidaik in Chinatown. So um, he extended the invitation to some other musicians, all having uh, roots in Asian culture, but all uh, living in the in the in the in the Western world, and um, and for a, for a performance in this shop. So there were Audrey Chen, Gun Tong, and Bu Jun Hun. Um, so in a way, this it was a sort, and also you can see the the son of Audrey Chen performing, who who joined the group as well at the end. So, in a way, um, um, this micro uh, community of musicians uh, was created for, for during, in this space in Zilek. Um The landscape of this performance, of this work, it was uh, this confrontation between the Asian culture and the Western world culture. And one of the aspects of, of this, this performance was, was um, the notion of the gates. Uh, of course, using this store front window, um, there was a sort of um, this element create a transition between the inside and the outside, whether uh, the outside was uh, only a viewing audience and inside uh, people could uh, listen to the performance. <coughs> uh, 
another aspect of the project was is uh, that it was um, made uh, <coughs> thanks to the collaboration of so many people. And one of the people who contribute was Matthias Joffra, uh, a designer who co-curate uh, the project, but also who designed the stage. Um, the stage was made uh, uh, as an architecture to distribute the, the performer in the, in the, at different levels. Um, so in a way, it was, it was a tool and to explore the volume of this empty shop. And it was what is interesting that the designer worked really, really closely uh, to Taku and to the musician. So um, I think it was an example of a different type of curating, like really a curating of a, an audio work through the design, so through the realization of this structure. So from, from this project, we can see how, uh, in a way, the, sp the space for, uh, for the performance is not, is not something uh, which, which has a fixed notion, but is, is, is something that can be rethinked and it can be redesigned, uh, in this case, through the collaborative uh, practice. So if there are some questions, I'd like uh, really if you want to ask that uh, directly during the, during the presentation. Can you elaborate a bit on the logistics of how do you assign space to an artist or artist to a space? Do they come to you? Do you come to them? Uh, no, I, I come, I mean, no, it's, there is no, there is no fix, fix uh, uh, until now I, I came to them. Uh, but but also no. Then, then there is an episode uh, in preparation, sort of September, where the artist came to me. Uh, it's really it's normally normally like curation. It's it's both ways actually. How do you produce it? Um, it's it's uh, each time. Uh, okay, the, the the fact that it's not, of course, uh, fixed in a place. Mm -hmm. It means that each time there is a partnership to be built. So each time uh, there are some subjects who, co who participate to the project. Uh, of course, it's, it's done uh, in a very, very like uh, low budget and with a lot of collaboration, but uh, the strategy for now is, is to, um, yeah, to each time find a local and non-local uh, partners to do this. And how did you come to this? Uh, yeah, it was it was really uh, because uh, the, the the art history part I, I mentioned is uh, a little bit part of the PhD I'm doing uh, about all these notions of the exhibition space and sound. Yeah, well, I mean, how did you come to uh, uh, to the idea of, of doing it in all those places? I understand that you don't have a fixed gallery, but was it? If how do you choose a place? It's the artist. It's the artist. It's the artist. That's, that's the important thing. The yes, okay. but not a place. Absolutely not a place. The artist can really say, oh, I want to do this in I mean, uh, it's, I mean, uh, I mean, if Hausbold would have said, oh, I want to do it in Grenoble, would it have been possible for you? Yeah, then there is the dialogue. I mean, the artist has to be realistic, and uh, and the artist is is in, in a sort. That's why I said it's, there is this like really uh, merging of curatorial and artistic strategy because mm -hmm. it really becomes a common common project. Yeah. It's not like the gallery that invites the artist to do something there, but it's the artist that proposes a place. But then, of course, this has to be feasible. Why so does the artist need you? Why don't they just do it? Well, because I work on, on logistic, uh, we, because I uh, work for finding the partnerships, and uh, I'm also, of course, in dialogue. And because, uh, uh, I mean, as, as uh, the gallery, I mean, the concept of the gallery, I think it creates a sort of um, story, yeah. which could be interesting for, for the artist to confront and to, to be part of and to see how, I mean, each place is different and what, what it, it is created after that. Yeah. But you see yourself 
not as an artist yourself. It's not a mm. project. It's not an art project. No, but it's really at the border. It's at the border. Right? Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, as I said, uh, what is interesting is is that it it put in discussion. I mean, it uh, there is no fix really, really is merging a little bit these these notions yeah. of, of who is the artist, who is the creator, and and it's an experimentation, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's move to Beijing. Uh, the last episode, which was done in uh, in uh, November. Uh, by Yan Jun, who also was recently at Cafe Auto. Um, so Yan Jun uh, decided um, to, to do this piece in a newspaper office, this very special uh, place, um, very messy, also eventually relaxing. <laughs> so um, yeah, basically what he wanted to do, um, he used uh, some uh, very basic technologies like cassette recorders, cassette players, and MP3, MP3 players, all connected to air, uh, headphones, and place these item, items in the in the desks of of the of the journalist in, in different places. So there, there were these headphones coming out and. Um, playing sounds uh, available during the day, the day uh, working day of the journalist. Uh, the sounds were made um, of uh, pre-recorded interviews. Uh, there were some um, uh, recording of of the space, of the sound of the ambience of the office, replayed in real time and also um, creating some feedback noise uh, through the earphones. Um, so it was this, all this sort of sound. And in this, in this case as well, uh, we see how this work is made, is made for a specific <laughs> audience. Uh, so I think Yan Jun wanted to, in a way, be part of, of the daily life of the journalist. And uh, just to finish, like uh, just to mention the, uh, the two episodes in preparation, one is in Paris in May and by Aki Onda in this uh, chapel of Beaux-Arts, um, which is a chapel that have uh, all the replicas of masterpiece like uh, The Last Judgment by Michelangelo and all the other similar works. And uh, in September, there is uh, Matteo Nasini uh, with some Eolian uh, resonators, uh, which are based on the Kepler's uh, Music of the Spheres, and uh, that will be installed uh, in this uh, observatory, this astronomical observatory in Rome. So that's it. Thank you. I'll open that up so you can have a look at that. It's not this one. Okay. Um, <laughs> so we opened. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is. Um, we opened Cafe Otto, as I said, just under two years ago. Um, prior to that, we've been um, running um, events and spaces around London. And um, for this, these, these are images of, of the space that we took as we took it on. So this was, um, it, was in a, it was it was an abandoned warehouse um, in Hackney, which is northeast London, quite a rundown, poor area of, of London. Um, we'd, prior to this, we've been running events um, for about two years, I suppose. Two years every month. About uh, once a month. Um, and it was, it was scattered around the city, so they're kind of dodgy old back rooms of pubs, kind of smelly, nasty little places. And, um, and at the time, London didn't feel like it had any one centre representing the type of music that we were interested in. There were people doing interesting stuff around the city, but there was no kind of focus to it in terms of um, bricks and mortar, in terms of a, a one place where you could go 
every night of the week and there'll be something interesting happening. And so we felt quite frustrated about that and the, we thought we could have a bigger impact by actually having a permanent space um, where we could program things, um, as I say, every night of the week. And, and rather than having this scattered around um, London. And, and, and also that in doing that, we might attract an audience that weren't already engaged with this sort of music. Because the problem with those events that were happening irregularly and in, in different spaces all the time is they tended to um, attract the sorts of people that were already very knowledgeable about this kind of music, already um, reading the Wire magazine and the Resonance and so yeah. <laughs> FM and so forth. Um, so but we're not only interested in the, those kind of wider wide, wide readers kind of, uh, kind of music. Are we also interested in more kind of um, diversity of nature of music, which is including classical, tribal music, world music, um, traditional music from mm. all other countries? Yeah. So, we, um, so we set this place up. We, we, we spent um, almost, um, almost two years actually looking for space. I mean, London is an incredibly difficult city to find spaces in um, to do this sort of thing. People say to us, it feels a lot more like somewhere like that might happen in Berlin or a city like that. I've never been to Berlin, neither of us have, so we don't know, but that's what we're told. <laughs> um, because finding this kind of abandoned space is, is virtually impossible. It's, rent in London is abs absolutely ridiculous, um, and just living is, is very, very hard, let alone trying to find a space where you can present experimental music. And we, so we looked very, very hard. We found this, this factory, which was... On, on the ground floor, it was disused. It was in a, a, a rather intimidating back alley at the time. It was there's no it's kind of badly lit and quite in quite a scary bit of town. <laughs> this is the outside of it. Yeah. And um, and we opened it. We once we found the space, there was lots of negotiations with the council about getting licenses and so forth. And we really had um, we had no no funding whatsoever. We had a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of money um, from the council, and we, and we had um, a small loan. It wasn't a grant, it was a loan, um, basically because the area, that, that particularly that bit of the area, was, was um, needed regenerating, and they, they wanted to, to have businesses opening up there. So there was, there was this sort of local development loan, which we got to do it, um, which just about covered the building costs. And, um, and so we had about six months of setting up and and then we opened and it was and it's been run basically just by the two of us yeah. <laughs> and, and doing stuff seven nights a week um, and, a, and a large team of volunteers and that's that's how we've sustained it so we've yeah. we've had virtually no funding since we opened um, and it's meant we've worked sort of from nine o'clock in the morning till two o'clock the following morning seven days a week Trying to trying to keep the place afloat, and and we rely purely on um, on, on on getting enough people through the door and tickets. Yeah, tickets so. there and also the selling alcohol behind the bar. Yeah. So this is this is the space as you can see. It's slowly sort of changing as, as you can see from from image to image. We've um, well, one of the one of the things we, we, that was important when we set it up was we wanted to do um, we wanted to invite people to London who perhaps had never played in the UK before and were unknown to UK audiences. So we, we set up a residency program um, and we had a little bit of money from the Sasakawa Foundation. We brought over some people from Japan. Obviously, Keiko's Japanese. So we had a, an immediate connection with, 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 with Japan and some musicians out there. Yeah. And we invited people over for, um, for three nights to perform, often collaborating with other um, lo local London-based players. So the, uh, we thought it would be nice rather than just simply getting people when they're on tour in, in Europe or in the UK, we'd be able to invite people over and for them to play three consecutive nights um, and, and play with a, with a whole bunch of different players. And, and through that process, people would get maybe a, a, a broader perception of, um, of, what, of, <laughs> of, of their work and, and the dis different aspects of it. Um, and so we started that off. I think uh, Ken Mikami okay. was one of the first people, Otomo Yoshide's, come over on that program, um, Kath Bloom, uh, Peter Brotsman recently, Matthew Shipp, a pianist from New York, um, and Yoshida, Yoshida, <laughs> Yoshida. Um, and that was, that, that, that's been quite an important part of what we do. We've also worked with um, 
because we're doing there's stuff going on seven nights a week here. So we were um, we don't we we don't program it all ourselves. We program I think probably at the moment over fifty percent of it is us, and then uh, the rest of the time we're working with musicians and with other organizers to, um, mm. to put on events. Um, so in a way, that's quite good um, exchange, because if we program 100% by ourselves, that kind of inevitably reflects in our, little bit of our taste. But if we ask other promoters or promoters or organizers to put their own event, it's kind of even out. So of interest. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're very like, we're very conscious about it not appealing to one small kind of kind of well-educated group of people in in, the, in this sort of this sort of field. Like we really want it to be very accessible, um, in a way uninstitutionalized. We, I think one of the things that appeals to people about Capital and what makes it distinct, certainly from other venues in London, is that it is run in a very DIY sort of way. It's not run with a lot of money. It's clearly um, very independent, and there's not um, there's not a lot of the stuff that goes with just leave it. It's fine. <laughs> goes with larger organisations that um, that actually make them clunky and slightly dysfunctional in, in some respects. I mean, we've, we've started to work with some big organisations and, and seeing how how slowly they are to res they are to respond to certain ideas. It, I think is reflective of what happens when Often organisations get a lot of funding, and, and each decision they, they make has to be justified to a whole load of people. One of the, the advantages of not having funding, and there's lots of disadvantages, obviously, is that you have to do things on, on a shoestring. But one of the advantages is you can actually um, be very responsive and do things very quickly, and you don't have to justify every decision to a whole bunch of other people. So if someone says to us, we want to play in four weeks' time, and we can fit them in, then we just do it, and we take a punt on it, and we hope we get enough people in to cover that. So. Mm. We just we take a take a risk yes. on it, um, and that's that's frightening and quite exhausting doing that over and over again. But it's it also gives it a certain immediacy and it stops it. I think I think there is something to be said about doing stuff without funding. And a lot of these abstract ideas that you talk about when when you people write funding applications about appealing to broader audiences, about um, introducing new people to the music, those are kind of Abstract ideas for, for us, they're, 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 they're a necessity. It's, we're, we're not doing it as part because we're not saying those things because we have to. We, we're doing it because we, we want, need to get funding. We, we, we have to get different people into the space every night because if we don't, we just can't survive. And um, and so there's a sort of it's it's in, in a way it's 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 governed governed partly by a, uh, an ethos and a principle, but it's also just the sort of basic market forces of mm. running a venue and in in, a, in what is a very Difficult situation in, 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 a, in a city that's very, very hard to, to survive in. Um, we also now open um, the space as a cafe during the daytime, so people just come for coffee and uh, just chill and walk, and laptop. And then some of those people don't really know that we are actually venue in the evening. And then those people just happen to pick up our leaflet and then just discover that we are actually hosting mm. music. And then those people randomly come by, and then mm. they discovered mm. things they necessarily did not, wasn't interested in before, but they come yeah. become repeater or regular customers in the evening as well. I mean, you become quite sort of um, tactical about the way you do it. So, so we might, with, within one night, there might be more than one performer. We might introduce younger, lesser known, perhaps more experimental mu musicians on the night where there's somebody mm. who we know are going to pull a crowd in, and so. That is important to us to mix it up in terms of styles of music, but also generations and, and, and how well-known musicians are. So we we have some some local musicians here who are completely unknown, but um, but that we think are doing interesting things, and we try and put them together with larger, more established names on the, maybe on the same bill, maybe also collaborating. Mm -hmm. So that the, the the venue has a, a sort of educational benefit to, to those players as well. It's, it becomes a centre and a community for people, a kind of alternative college, a kind of a, a, a sort of place where people can come and learn from, from watching other, other people play without, um, without perhaps the formalities of, 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 of the sort of education system. Um, yeah. If people have any, if people want to interrupt us at any time, if they have any questions, they can. Because in a sense, what we, what we do is there's, um, it, 
the, 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 there are principles behind the way we're running this, but, but there's also um, a lot of it's our, our daily lives are taken up with very kind of practical considerations of just trying to make this place sustainable. Um, and that's why it's, I mean, it's interesting for us to come somewhere like here and see a completely sort of different mm -hmm. way of, of operating. Um, but we're, at the moment, we're, we're, we're looking to sort of expand and change what we do. We, we've, um, we've been making uh, recordings of, of a lot of the concerts at Café Otto and um, with on, on the brink of starting a small Café Otto uh, record label um, and also um, and also just generally thinking about how we archive things because we, we're so involved in the day-to-day -day running of the place that um, a lot of what happens to us to goes through the venue is obviously ephemeral and it doesn't ever get sort of recorded or archived so we're thinking more and more about how we um, about how we, how, we, how we record stuff, how we present it afterwards, and what are the documents that sort of survive from, from the space, and how also the space can have a life outside of itself and perhaps become, represent something bigger than just, just, just the place where people come to play, to play music. Mm -hmm. um, we're also trying to extend the residency program. I mean, the, the, the dream is really to have um, a little like, like this place, there's somewhere where, where artists can come and stay, mm -hmm. maybe stay for a month, and as well as play, can actually create new works. And, um, and collaborate with, with, with people based in the UK. At the moment, the residency is kind of a grand term for playing three concerts in a row, and it could become, yeah. it could turn into something a little bit more than that. I mean, we, 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 give, we gave it a grand name, we're hope, hoping that it will grow into it, <laughs> grow into it. But, um, but at the moment, it's, it's still in that sort of developmental stage. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, what strikes me when I go to Cafe Otto is that during the daytime, <laughs> the nerds. And, then, um, and then at night, there's a lot of actual local musicians who come mm -hmm. to see the shows. Mm -hmm. and, um, it's, and there are some people left over from the daytime too, but mm -hmm. then it's, I hear a lot of musicians talking about going to Cafe Oto to just check out you know, performances. Mm -hmm. um, is there sort of some kind of, is that just not organically happening through the neighborhood and through the city scene, or is there some sort of strategy that you guys? Partly, I mean, I mean, we, we, because we do these, um, because there, there are lots of volunteers working for us. If any, on any night when you come, probably the guy running the door, people running the bar, people picking up bottles and so forth. A lot of those guys will be musicians, and they'll come. I mean, it's 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 amazing how how generous people are with their time. I mean, a lot of those people will come um, almost every night of the week, some of them. And so, that, so there's a lot. I think a lot of them come, come to lots of events like that, and. And then, uh, yeah, it, it, because, it's, because it is fixed in that one space, because we're not doing it scattered around the city, it is just known as, as somewhere where you can drop by and, 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 and watch stuff w almost all the time. And, and, and it is, because rents are a little cheaper in that neighborhood than, than some, it's, um, there are a lot of artists living around there, there are a lot of musicians living around there. So um, it yeah, kind of makes sense, the, the location of it, mm -hmm. um, to attracting those, those from 9.30 till 5.30. Yeah. And we have two hours of sound checking. And then we turn it into evening shift. But, but on that street, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of there's studios. Lot of there's studios. some recording studios underneath mm -hmm. us. There's some um, artist studios across the road from us. Mm -hmm. And there's been some collaborations with, with them as well. So it's, um, mm -hmm. it, I mean, it's very rooted in that area. It's, it's not... I think if we were running this thing, this is our yeah. first night. We, we finished now. <laughs> you, you, yeah. Don't worry, you don't have to see any more, <laughs> any more photos of people painting walls. You've seen enough. <laughs> so this is the first night, yeah. And then there's the, 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 some images of, of early performances and some recent performances coming up as well. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know how well the venue would work in, in West London or, or in a fancier neighbourhood. I, I don't think it would. A, a, we wouldn't have been able to find that space, but B, there wouldn't be that community um, actually coming to the venue. Um, all the time. So that's, yeah, it's important yeah, mm. where it is. Mm. Mm. And how do you cope? Um, um, <laughs> by the skin of our teeth. I mean, but very, it's, it's very hand to mouth. Yeah. I mean, we. We, we don't have any funding. We still don't, we, we, have, we still don't have any funding. We, we get a little bit occasionally for very specific events, but there's yeah. no like core funding. Mm. Um, 
So, but we do get good audiences. I mean, we've been lucky, and I think because because the, the place has got known within London, because what we're doing is quite different to other places, and you don't get these independent venues opening up in London, people talk about it, and it it, it, it had quite a quite a quick impact on the, on the scene. I mean, within we were very open. Like initially, we whilst whilst all that building work was taking place. We just called up everybody we thought would be interested in it and said, come and have a look at this space. We're opening this thing. Do you want to get involved? And almost everybody kind of said yes. And, and, and those people have, have ended up getting involved in terms of programming stuff, in terms of helping out with the running of it. Um, I think there was, a real, there was a real thirst in London for this sort of place to open, and there was a real void as well. There was um, the, a couple of venues closed around the same time. Mm. We opened the, the Red Rose and the, another Spitz. place that's called The Spitz. Um, and they, they closed almost just, uh, just before we opened. And they, they were doing some of the sorts of things that we're doing, but they're also doing lots of other kinds of music as well. So uh, there was, yeah, there was, there was a genuine sort of gap in, in, in what was uh, representing this type of music in London at the time. Mm. Um, and because of that, there was a lot of goodwill, there was a lot of support. I mean, people mm. like Resonance FM, ha, ha, which is a small independent artist, Radio in London, I mean, they've been very supportive of us. They do jingles all the time, helping promote our shows. The Wire have been very supportive. Um, and, and musicians themselves have been very, very supportive. So we've, we've, been, we've been lucky. I mean, it's, it's suspended on a kind of cloud of goodwill. It always feels like it shouldn't work. <laughs> People look at us and say, look, you know, you're trying yeah, to put on experimental I music. I want to think the other way around. Why don't more people in London? It's like fucking 50 million people. In <laughs> <laughs> why are there more places like this? Yeah. this well, yeah. 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 Well, then, well we, we thought the same thing, and that's yeah. why we opened it. <laughs> I mean, that was, that, we, we thought, like, what well, we all. There, there's enough people in the city to support someone like this, there's enough musicians to support a place like to this. Tokyo, it's, yeah, I'm surprised how yeah. small yeah. percentage of people actually doing something yeah. like this. I mean, this is our first ever show. Um, Sire from the tennis court. Mm -hmm. May or may not know, but um, yeah, I mean, we should say, but before we were running this place, we we have no we have no background in arts organisation whatsoever. We've got no um, training in it. We had no prior experience of it. We um, we studied at art college. Um, I studied painting. Keiko studied media studies, um, not not media studies, media arts, <laughs> and we um, and we met there, and then we we lived in. Japan for a little while. I spent some time in, in America, and and it was it was actually seeing how, how other cities operated. It, seeing mm -hmm. seeing that there's, there seemed to be particularly in, in Japan more independently run small venues that had a clear identity and a sense of purpose to the programming. I mean, in London, programming just seemed determined by making money. You, if someone called you up and booked your venue, you gave them a gig. You know, if they could pay you however much money you wanted, <laughs> and that whereas there seemed to be places particularly in Tokyo, where they, where they were being run with some sort of um, identity around their, around their programming. Um, and so we were, w yeah, when we came back to London, I think that we had a sort of certain perspective on the scene that, that having sort of lived in some other places <coughs> gave us. We kind of came back and looked at it and thought, why, why the hell is there, aren't more people doing something like this here? And um, that that's was mm. what kicked it off for us, yeah. The fact that you don't have funding yeah. because you're not applying as a member of principle, or you're applying and not getting it. <laughs> That's good, good point. point. We don't have time to apply as well. Yeah, yeah we don't have time to apply. We're not very good at it. Mm. Um, but, uh, we, we should. Uh, we should. I mean, I mean, I mean, it's 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 it's, it's, a, it's a bit of both. I mean, like the some people coming up to us who are giving us cards and saying, "Look, I work for this organisation. You should apply to us because we'd like to give you money." And then we we, work, we get up at nine o'clock in the morning and work till two o'clock in the morning, and we're, and we're just like, oh god, we, we don't have any time to write the damn things. And and as a as a result, we don't get these applications off. That that's beginning to change. We're trying to sort of think this is crazy. We should get some money because, I mean, especially for the more ambitious sides of what we're doing. Like if, if you're trying to bring, a, I mean, we've done crazy things where we've invited musicians over, and we know if we don't sell out three nights in a row, we're going to lose money. If we sell out three nights, we might just break even if we're lucky. And the Sun Ra, <laughs> for example, the Sun Ra Orchestra were case, case in point. And, um, you know, putting that many guys up in a hotel and so forth and hiring all their equipment, it's, it's, it's a nightmare and we didn't have a penny in order to do that. Um, 
But at the same time, the, the only reason we're sitting here talking about the venue, the only reason the venue's been talked about at all is that we did take those kind of risks. We could have been more conservative, we could have played it safer and not done these things, but then it wouldn't, it, it would have just been, an, you know, it wouldn't have been an exciting place. So we, so we felt that we had to kind of put our necks on the line and just that kind of leap of faith of let's just, fuck it, let's just do it and, 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 and hope that it, and just pray that it works. Um, there had to be that kind of mentality, otherwise the thing wouldn't have happened in the first place. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the whole, from beginning to end, it was, it was just, it, it was, we knew we were taking a big personal risk in it, because we, we don't have, as we should also say, we don't have any money, we're not, we're not bankrolled, we're not like some aristocrats who are kind of, this isn't some vanity project, you know, we're not, we're not bankrolling this ourselves. It had to survive, and it had also, we had to be able to, to We'll be honest with you, we had to be able to draw enough money from it to be able to pay our own rent because we, there's no other way that we're going to be able to live. Um, I mean, yeah, we're not living there. Yeah, we're not living in the space. We're not living in the space. That would be, that, be crazy. <laughs> we're, 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 we're almost living in the space because we're there, but we're not, we're, not, we're not literally living in the space. No. Um, there, is, uh, there are other people in the team uh, as a fix? Programmer just him just no, finished. Not working. I mean, uh, working. Of you, uh, uh, we have uh, actual staff who physically run the space, which is um, okay. cafe manager and four other girls who run the cafe and mm. two. Yeah. But that's relatively a recent. Of barman, but yeah. We always work behind the bar as well. We, we, we're always working behind the bar every single night. <laughs> every night. And, and, and managing the musicians and trying yeah. to run the whole thing. But, I mean, to begin with, we ran the cafe as well. It, it basically, we, it's, it's a new thing we started to employ people when they run the cafe. Before, I mean, it, we, we'd be sitting on, uh, there running the cafe, trying to program stuff <laughs> on our laptops and someone orders a cappuccino and you have to <laughs> jump up. And, yeah. and to keep, so, like, begin, to begin with, that's how it was. For, for most of the, you know, for the first sort of year, basically. Then a few friends started um, helping us out. Uh, Peter uh, Potsman. Yeah. Actually, we could show you a little clip of Peter Potsman playing recently, which is nice. But, um, How are we doing time? How are we doing? Are there more questions? Maybe we should answer more questions. Have you used the, the space to like, show any time-based installation work at all? Or is this just a live work? Um, well, one off thing. I mean, I mean like, 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 like th things which are, are durational and can happen mm -hmm. across the, the, a period of an evening, yes. We haven't shut the venue down for, like, say, a week and, and done an installation. Um, partly because, actually, I mean, that would be almost impossible for us to finance. <laughs> we need to keep selling tickets. We need to keep selling alcohol to keep paying our rent. Um, and also, I'm not sure how it would work in, in the... Maybe it could work in the space. I mean, you know, I, I mean, people often show f Film. films or people do works which are more like installation or... Um, there's, there's a whole different... I mean, there's, there's people that you that may, maybe would describe themselves as um, I, okay, as sound artists, and there are people that maybe would des describe themselves as um, a, a, as musicians. But 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 it's not. Um, yeah, no, we we haven't really done that much installation installation based stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, well, I mean, you guys seem like you're, uh, although you are running on a shoestring, you're doing pretty well. Um, so, I mean, yeah, you, 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 <laughs> you don't see how we live from day to day. <laughs> you say we're doing pretty well. I mean, well, no, I mean, uh, well, I mean, it, we, it, we all want to fundamentally change what we do. I think we, it, it would, we, we would, we would keep, we, we would, we'd just try and do what we do a little bit better. So there's some things which we, we, get, we get emails from people saying, we want to do this in your space, we want to come and play there, and we have to say no to, to quite a lot of stuff because we just have to say, look, to be honest, we don't think we can make that work financially because we've got no funding. And it'd be nice to say yes to a few of those things. I mean, and that's, you know, it'd be nice to invite some more people from abroad, it'd be nice to do some kind of residencies. We are limited by what we can afford to do. In terms of what you know, what we could, what we can sell tickets for, and we do lose money on certain things, and then we have to try and subsidise it by those things. Sometimes we let the place out because someone has a birthday party or something. You know, I mean, we we have to be realistic about mm. it, um, which is fine. And I, I, you know, there is there is something nice about feeling we're independent, and that sort of like 
we don't have to go groveling up to anybody. We don't have to justify what we're doing to anybody. And we, we can just sort of, you know, if people don't like what we, we, we do, then that's, that's their problem. You know, we, we're doing it and it's, it's, it's sustaining itself. But there are, it would be nice to, to feel that, that we could, I mean, for, for example, when I talked about wanting to do longer residency, it'd be nice to actually be able to invite somebody over and say, well, rather than playing just three nights, do you want to come and stay here for a month? And do you want to collaborate with some people and, and develop some new relationships with other musicians? Yeah, possibly um, recordings. Yeah, and, 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 and make some new recordings mm -hmm. um, with people. And, and for, for the space, I mean, you know, our aspirations for it is, is that it can become more than just a venue. It can become somewhere where, where people are creating new works. And, and that's very, that, 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 that's just not possible for us at the moment without, without mm -hmm. any funding. And, and I don't know, I mean, you know, it is, it's psychologically kind of pretty, pretty wearing when, when you're constantly putting your neck on the line and, and, and you're often losing money and you, then you're try, trying to sort of subsidize it by having another busy night. And it's, it's, it's just a very precarious existence at the moment. And it, it would be nice to, to feel like we can do those more ambitious, exciting things without constantly... It's peace of mind. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's more than just a peace of mind, but it's yeah, but, it would but, yeah. I mean, it, we, we, you know, there's no. Um, but at the same time, I, you know, I, I look at it and I think this could drift into becoming an institution. Mm -hmm. This could become somewhere that gets a lot. Of, you know, well, maybe, maybe it couldn't, but it, you know, if it did start to get say a lot of funding, and you start to employ lots more people, and it becomes much more structured, mm -hmm. and then there's some of that, the spontaneity about the place at the moment, so some of its independence could be lost. Mm -hmm. And so, like, mm -hmm. I, we wouldn't want, and we, and we are a bit kind of control freaky about it. Like, we, we've got an idea about what we're trying to run, and we don't want somebody else telling us how to do it. We, we, we want to keep that independence. So, I think, I think you can create a, create a culture within that that keeps the, the independence. Yeah, uh, yeah, well, well that, I, I think you can too. And uh, so, so I don't think it's impossible. I, I just think it's, I think, You've got to have. A, I think you've got to have a clear grounding of, of, of what it is you're trying to do, we and then. Know because we have yeah, yeah, we don't know. Maybe, maybe maybe money would change it, but um, but but I think I, th I, th I think so long as, so like, I think so long as the core of it, that there is an ethos and there's a certain kind of principle behind it, that's quite solid and tangible, and, and, you, and you're kind of clear-headed about that, then I think I think you can. I think yeah, you could have, you, you you could. Utilize some funding without without really losing that. Um, yeah. Any more questions? About the music? How, how do you? <laughs> how Financial side of the kind of Yeah, yeah. No, we're talking about practical stuff at the moment. Um. Well, we we get tons of emails of them now now that we've been running. So so a lot of it's sifting through things looking for what's in, what we personally find interesting. Um. I mean, I think, I think there's always this balance, like, I mean, it's, it, we're looking for stuff that we think wouldn't, another venue in London perhaps wouldn't put on, um, and that we, we find interesting. I think that you've got to be careful when running a venue that it doesn't become a thing about personal taste, that it doesn't become too subjective. I think you want to think about, that, is this interesting? Does it deserve a platform? Is it being represented somewhere else already? And if it's not being represented anywhere else and you think it is interesting, whether, I li whether we personally like it or not, if we think it's, and if people are trying to do something kind of quite new and it's kind of quite edgy, or, then you think, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll take a chance on that. Um, but it's, and, and, and that's also, an, uh, that's a nice thing about working with other people and, and working with other organizations. Like, you know, at the moment there's somebody doing a series on quite traditional forms of, um, sort of Asian folk music. Now, that's not something that, that we're grounded in. It's not something I have any particular knowledge in. But it feels it feels like it, it, it can exist alongside, you know, Otomo Yoshide or Peter. You know, it, it does. It, it feels like it can be part of the program because we're doing stuff seven nights a week. Can be expansive enough that it can accommodate all these things, and it doesn't have to. Um, it doesn't have to be too narrow, and it, and it, and it shouldn't. It shouldn't become... Cater only one no, type of audience. No, I, I, I think that it, it, we don't want it to feel like um, a sort of slightly exclusive, um, sort of potentially pretentious kind of place where 
it's going to appeal to, to a certain type of audience. I think there's always that, you know, there's always, yeah, we, 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 we're not, um, there's, no, there's no snobbery about, about the sorts of things that go on. We just think, is this interesting and does it, does it deserve a platform? Um, and, then, and then also because, because we have all those financial concerns, we have to also think, are we going to, we, we can subsidize so many things. We can have so many quiet nights a month, but we've also got to try and make the whole thing function and work. So can we have to look at something? Else? No, no, I have to. Sure. Uh, roughly, how many uh, tickets would you need to sell in order for an event to 